Hello Warriors, this is Miss Lemons coming at you today with the Ideal Gas Law. All right, so the Ideal Gas. Um, we briefly mentioned this at the very beginning of the entire unit, uh, but let's go over this again. In a perfect world, there are three ways that gases behave. Perfect gases, ideal gases. One, the particles do not interact with each other. No attractions, no IMFs. Two, the size of the particles is negligible. It doesn't really matter. They don't even have a volume. We don't consider them to have volume. Uh, three, the collisions are perfectly elastic, meaning that when two particles come together, they power, and then they also uh, follow those gas laws perfectly. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind this. Very few things in science are perfect. And so that's why we had to come up with the ideal gas law. Gases don't actually behave this way. They behave very, very, very close, but they don't behave this way. That being said, they behave really close. And so we're able to kind of fudge the numbers a little bit and use the ideal gas law to help us calculate things. So we just assume that gases are perfect, even though they're not, okay? So the combined gas law and the previous gas laws assume that there's a change in the system, a before and an after. But what if there isn't a change in the system and we just want to analyze the properties of a gas at certain conditions? Well, that's where the ideal gas law comes in. The equation for the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT, PIVNERT. That's how I've always been taught it. That's how you guys are gonna remember it, PIVNERT. And we're familiar with PV, N, and T. We've used them in the combined gas law and all the other gas laws leading up to the combined gas law, but we haven't talked about R. R is a constant, the ideal gas constant. And we use it to calculate the properties of gases at their current state. Check out these units. Liters ATM per Kelvin mole. Kind of a crazy unit, right? We got four different units all sandwiched into one big unit. But if you look even closer, liters, ATM, Kelvin, and mole. That means that we are allowed to use any units outside of those four. So if you're given milliliters, you're gonna have to convert milliliters to liters in order to plug it into the ideal gas law and use this constant. If we're given kilopascals, we can't use kilopascals. We'll have to convert kilopascals to ATM in order for us to use PIVNERT, okay? So I do have two videos that I posted on Edpuzzle. Uh, they're both by Hank Green of Crash Course Chemistry and I'm obsessed with that man and everything that he does. Um, he does speak really, really fast. I know that I can too. So I advise um, if you don't watch the Edpuzzles, you should go on to YouTube, locate those videos, and then uh, slow the speed down, the, sl the playback speed. You can do that in the bottom right-hand corner of any YouTube video. Um, in addition to going over the, the concepts of the ideal gases, Hank Green also has a video going through calculations using the ideal gas law. Highly recommend. He also talks about um, Hindenburg, and um, it's a really interesting story. Highly recommend you guys take a look at those. They're great practice problems. Um, to follow along with. Anyway, um, so let's go ahead and do some practice from our own worksheet. This right here is number one on our practice worksheet. It says a 12 liter tire contains four moles of the gas at pressure of 567 kilopascals. Calculate the temperature in Kelvin of the gas in the tire. So we've got 12 liters, which is volume. We got four moles, which is moles. We got 567 kilopascals, which is pressure, and we're trying to calculate the temperature in Kelvin. Now, keep in mind, guys, if you look at this word problem, we don't have two sets of variables. We don't have two volumes and two sets of moles and two pressures. We only have one of everything. And so that's one of the tricks that you can use to decide whether you're using the combined gas law or you're using the ideal gas law. In this instance, we are using the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT. We only have one of everything. We have volume, number of moles, pressure, and we're looking for Kelvin. And remember guys, R 
is a constant, and that's something that's always provided for us. This is going to be provided for you on your test next week. So that's 0 0.0821 liters ATM per Kelvin mole. Now there's a big problem with that. Remember guys, if we don't have ATM, we can't use that value. So we have kilopascals. We need to convert kilopascals from a, uh, into ATM. And we're gonna do that by using this conversion factor. Again, this is another conversion factor that will be provided for you on your test next week. So we're gonna start with what we know, which is 567 kilopascals over unit list one. And we know that we're gonna multiply that by a conversion factor. Remember in dimensional analysis, the units that are on top must come down on the bottom. Kilopascals needs to go on the bottom. So the number will be 101.3 kilopascals on the bottom. And we're trying to get to ATM. So we're gonna put one ATM on top. Now notice the 760 millimeters of mercury we're actually not doing anything with that right now. We don't have millimeters of mercury, nor do we need to get to millimeters of mercury. So we can just cast it aside and forget about it. We'll multiply our, our, our numerators together. We'll multiply our denominators together to create a new fraction. We'll then divide the uh, denominator from the numerator, and we end up with 5.59724 ATM. All right, now we've got ATM. We can plug this information into the ideal gas law equation. This is what our setup should look like. The first thing that I want to do is simplify this problem by combining like terms. So I'm going to multiply um, our pressure and our volume together. I'm also going to multiply the number of moles to the ideal gas constant, and it will give me 67.1668 is equal to 0.3284x. Now notice that I'm not paying attention to sig figs, don't worry about sig figs until the very last step. All right, so now that I've simplified that uh, those sides of the equation, I'm gonna go ahead and isolate x. Right now, 0.3284 is multiplied by x, and in order to get x by itself, we need to divide both sides by 0.3284. When I do that, I end up with 204.5274 equals x. The last step is going to be rounding according to the rules of significant digits. If we look at all the values that have been given to us, each of them has three sig figs. So our final answer should also have three sig figs, which makes the final answer for question number one, 205 Kelvin. If we take a look at number, oops, that should say number two. Number two, um, it says an 88.89 liter gas sample contains 17 moles of gas at a temperature of 67 degrees Celsius. Calculate the pressure of the gas. Now keep in mind, do we have two sets of variables? Do we have two volumes, two numbers of moles, two temperatures, two pressures? No, and because we don't, we're not observing a change in the system. That means we're not gonna be using the combined gas law. Instead, we're gonna be using PIVNERT, ideal gas law. And remember, R is a constant that's provided to us. Its units are liters ATM per Kelvin, Kelvin mole. And if you don't have anything, or if you have anything outside of those units, you need to convert them. We do. We have Celsius. And we need to convert Celsius to Kelvin. This is the conversion factor that you're going to use to convert Celsius into Kelvin. There's no dimensional analysis needed for this one. I know you're relieved to hear that. Um, again, this is going to be provided on your test, so don't worry about memorizing it. You just need to know how to use it. We plug in the information that we know, so it'll be 67 degrees Celsius plus 273, and that gives us 340 Kelvin. Now we can plug in our information into the original ideal gas law equation. This is what our setup should look like. The first thing that I'm going to do is simplify both sides by combining like terms. I'm going to multiply 17 times 0 0.0821 times three, uh, 340. And I'm gonna multiply X times 88.89. And I'm gonna end up with 88.89 X is equal to 474.538. And again, don't forget, uh, don't worry about the sig figs right now. All right, now that I've simplified both sides, I want to isolate X. 
And because 88.89 is multiplied by x, I'm going to divide by 88.9 to get x by itself. And I'm going to do that to both sides. So 474.538 divided by 88.89. That gets me 5.338486. The last step, of course, is going to be rounding according to the rules of sig figs. So if we look back at the values that have been given to us throughout the word problem, uh, this has four sig figs. Uh, this has two sig figs, and this has two sig figs. So our final answer should also have two sig figs, and that would make our final answer to be 5.3 ATM. Thanks, guys. If you have any questions, you know you can always reach out to me via email, remind, or on a video chat. And uh, the test is just right around the corner. It is next week, Thursday. So if you have questions, make sure you are taking advantage of the opportunities to ask them or reach out to me, or use your peers, or use the resources that I've given you. Thanks, guys, and have a wonderful day.